This is uh, Fog Hangout Session 2 uh, for Fog Project. Um, we have Senior Developer Joe Schmidt and Austin with us so far. Morning, guys. Good morning. Morning. All right. So, what have you guys been doing with Fog lately? Well, since our last um, hangout, I now have all six of our locations up and running. Um, so, I've been quite busy. We have um, all the images and stuff replicated. I've been doing some testing around there. Um, I just upgraded this past week. And I have been running into a little bit more issues um, to where snap-ins just aren't cooperating with me right now. But um, as far as everything else, um, it seems to be going fairly well. And I have noticed, too, that if I have machines set to ATA instead of AHCI in the BIOS, that it doesn't get past the, um, the chain loading, which is kind of odd. But from a from an overall point, now that I have everything set up, um, I'm just trying to iron out those small little details before we start imaging uh, mass around the district in a couple of weeks. Uh, what what brand of computers do you have mostly? Uh, they're all Dell that we're imaging. Um, it's quite a bit. There's going to be. 745s, 55s, 60s, 80s, 90s, 990s, um, and then from laptops we have uh, 3330s, 40s, 50s. Um, uh, there's there's more 4300s. You know, the quite a bit. We have a a slew of different models, and I've noticed it. Uh, I've been testing a lot on a 790 this past week, just because it's behind my desk. And I noticed that there was a post in the forums the other day about, uh, I think it was snap-ins. And someone specifically mentioned that like half of their lab of 790s weren't joining the domain, but their other two labs were doing it fine. So I don't know if something happened with 790s and some of the latest updates, but it kind of made sense. I haven't had a chance to test uh, a couple other models yet. That's interesting. I wouldn't think that... Well, see, the Fog Client, it, it runs on top of the .NET framework or Mono, whichever OS it's installed on. And then that, of course, runs on top of the operating system, which... I mean, it doesn't... It doesn't make any hardware-specific calls, I don't think. So... It could be... I mean, are there error codes for when it... Uh, is trying to join the domain in the logs? Oh, well, I don't have it set to do the domain. I just noticed some oh. somebody else's post referring to snap-ins and 790s. In their particular case, they couldn't join the domain. Now, in my case, uh, I'd say about a week ago, I was running the latest version at that point in time. And... Uh, you know, the snap ins are going great. I do have them numbered numerically, so they trigger one, two, three. Um, and they were working great. And then I did an update, and some things started to not work quite right. Morning, Christopher. Hey, morning. Sorry I'm late. No big deal. You're, you're only four minutes late. Um... Um, let's see, so, you were talking earlier, uh, Austin, about, uh, ATI and AHCI, is there... Uh, a ATA, the, the SATA operations ATA. in the BIOS. Yeah, ATA, uh, 
is there uh so with Dell I believe there's a utility that I'm not sure if it gets installed on every computer or not but it's a utility that allows you to set the firmware settings on Dell computers in mass to no, that's interesting yeah now now if these Morning, if these machines were imaged with uh, with not with fault and they're not registered yet because we haven't that's part of our, our summer project stuff we're gonna be working on. Uh, what I'm seeing is is if previous technicians haven't set the BIOS to AHCI like they were supposed to and they left it as ATA, then when that machine reboots and it picks these to fog, it'll error out at the chain loader. But I've noticed uh, I had a, a, a 4300 that was set to ATA, and it couldn't exit to sand boot. So as soon as I changed into BIOS to do AHCI, it worked perfectly. So I'm assuming that uh, there's something that it, 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 it isn't liking uh, with the ATA setting and whatever the chain loader is or does. So I assume that you have network boot as the first uh, boot option in the boot list in firmware? Correct, and then it would actually get to. I think it would actually get to the um, uh, the fog menu, and then it would when it would try to boot to hard disk, it would then error out and then just continuously boot loop it there. I mean, we just ended up getting them past it, but uh, it was on a non-registered host set to a ATA. Tom says, "What about using grub exit type?" I have tried that on the 4300, and that did work, and I did write that down in my notes. Um, but I know we were trying to just have everything set to AHCI anyway. But I know in the past, if we have changed it from ATA to AHCI on an already imaged machine, that it would break uh, loading the OS. So we were a little gun-shy because it was on the administrator computer, but... Um, I think we might try to hit it this weekend I, or this summer. It was just kind of an odd uh, scenario of ATA not not getting past it. But the the bigger the bigger one was the the snap-ins. Uh, for whatever reason, I updated. A couple days ago, and it seemed like the snap in labeled one would not run, but then snap in two would run, and then it would reboot, but then snap in three would fail because snap in one didn't run, and they're they're kind of uh, dependent on each other. So does and snap, then, does snap uh, in one like, uh, does it not run or does it fail? I'm watching it in the task list in the fog management, and I'm seeing the three snap-ins are queued, and then it'll say snap-in two is in progress, and then the machine reboots because it's supposed to, and then when it tries to, or when it comes back in, it'll run the third script, and the first one will just sit there saying queued, what version which of, was kind of odd. What version of fog are you using? Uh, I just updated again. Uh, let's see, I wasn't working yesterday. I updated again Wednes. No, yesterday. I updated again yesterday, and then now none of the three snap-ins run. They just sit there and queued. Hmm. I forget what version. Well, I tried to VPN into my machine today, but for some reason, it wouldn't connect. So, but I know I'm running like whatever the latest one is as of like uh, yesterday, eighty. 18200 something uh, we're at 8259 right now all right yeah I wish I could get in and tell you the exact number it, it was probably whatever revision it was yesterday around 10:30 in the morning okay probably 8255 then it's somewhere around there. I think it's in the 8200, yeah. The, the version doesn't matter as much. I just need to try and track what's going on. You said none of your snappings are working anymore? 
on this, and like I said, I've only been testing it on one model, uh, but on the machine that I was using yesterday, I set an image, and it, it imaged, and then it pulled the drivers, and then when it goes to run the snap-ins, they all three just sat in queued, and then the administrator account just sat there. Eventually, it it went to sleep for sitting there so long because the snap-ins didn't run at all. And there's three snap-ins on the, on the first auto login, snap-in one runs, and then snap-in two runs, does a reboot, and then... It logs in again, runs the third snap in, and then we're set. But if the first one doesn't run, then it kind of messes up the whole whole thing because script three is calling some of the environment variable information that I have set in script one. Is okay. Um, if you want, we can try and do a remote session of some sort, and then I can possibly get you some more information. Um, I can use our debugger that Joe's kindly made, uh, which will probably help shed some light on what's actually happening. All right. Yeah, I'd have to try to set up a time for that now. I know, I mean, I work, as most of us seem to, in a school district, and the state pretty much runs what goes in and out. And I know they just recently blocked uh, TeamViewer and a lot of remote applications because of the apparent team viewer breach a few weeks ago so the state has been really locked down on it so I'm not sure what applications I can still use for remoting but we can always try at some point well and snap -ins run by downloading via FTP so if this is a relatively recent adjustment you might want to check that FTP can still actually work All right, what would I need to do for that? Um, I imagine you know you already know your FOG storage information contains the login and password for FTP. So grab right. that information and simply try and FTP into it from that client. Okay. Yeah, I use I do have FileZilla on my machine, and I have all of our uh, nodes saved in that. So. And I was using it, but I haven't used it in a couple weeks. So I could test it there, too, and then also test it on the machine that's not not running it. Uh, so with the machine, a machine that's not running it, it'd be worth checking the fog.log. My guess is there's a snap and hash uh, issue. Okay, I'd have to get on that machine when I get back to work on Monday. Because for some reason I can't get in my machine right now, so I, I can't get into it, but the, the only thing the snap-ins are doing is calling a PowerShell script. It's, uh, and you said it's universal, the snap-in one is universally failing on all computers now? Just after, after what I tested quickly the other day. Uh, I was running out of time because it was toward the end of the day, Wednesday, uh, and I I did some a couple of tests there, and the first snap in was failing. The second one would run and reboot as it needed to. So then I went ahead and did a update again, maybe seeing if something, you know, uh, if updating it would work. And then when I did that, then all three of them decided to just stay in queued. <clears throat> We're definitely going to need the fog.log like Joe said uh, to look at exactly what's happening um, that's your f always your first place to look to see what's going on what went wrong and the location for that is just c colon backslash fog.log usually now the, the client version wouldn't matter on that right I think right now I'm running 10.6 I haven't got 11.2 in the images yet and I think I still have it disabled for auto updating the client for when 11.0 uh, was putting that program file into the C drive that could be your problem right there um, the, the so the fog backend and web interface is developed simultaneously with the fog client 
changes are made by Joe and Tom together to fix things, make things work, and implement new features. And it could be very likely that just the version mismatch is causing your snap-ins to not work right. All right. Well, I'll have to, I was thinking along those lines. Uh, I guess I'll just confirm that and have to uh, try that out on uh, Monday. Yep. Morning, Scott. Hey, good morning. I almost missed you guys. I got a notice on my phone. I'm like, I gotta get home. I've been on vacation all week. Yeah, yeah. So what's what's new in the fog world for you? Uh, nothing too much. Um, it's been pretty stable for most of the summer. Um, we're, for um, Austin, we're also uh, a K-12 school district in Ohio. Um, and we've got about half the district image so far. Um, we came from a world of imaging um, on Novell Zenworks. Um, and that was horrific, pretty much. And uh, so we've been using fog for a couple years now. Um, been real happy with it. Um, so when I saw the hangout, I was like, I just kind of want to pop in there, see what's going on. Um, you probably have uh, seen posts from myself or Roger Saffel. He's actually my supervisor. Um, he was saying uh, green fog has gone end of life. Is that correct? Um, <clears throat> it probably maybe still works with uh, the legacy fog client. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Tom? Uh, like that. Client isn't working or is working. He uh, he had told me that he saw somewhere that it had gone end of life, um, but I haven't had a real chance to talk with him yet, so I don't know if he read that on the forums or if that was. Uh, so, green fog is still supported by legacy. Okay. In the name of the supported. You said just the legacy point anymore. Yeah, the latest yeah, information plan will still support it. Okay, I got you. Other than that, uh, I mean, we've been very, very, very happy with all the stuff we do. We're moving to Active Directory finally after many, many years of, of a Novell shop. So, um, but we still let Fog handle all of our printers, um, and it's been great. It's actually been probably the most reliable thing we've had. Um, so that works out pretty well. Um, like I said, I just kind of wanted to pop in here and see what was going on, and that's pretty much it. Appreciate it. Well, also, uh, Scott, you said you were a former Novell shop. As far as imaging goes, I have been working for the past two months getting rid of our imaging stuff, so I have devoted the past two months of my life trying to get Fog set up and running so I can ditch that disgusting imaging program that takes forever and a day to do anything. And so far, Fog has been the answer to it, and hopefully this summer it will prove me right, and I can finally ditch Zen imaging altogether. It will, it will definitely prove to be the better solution. Um, when we first started playing with Fog, um, we actually thought it wasn't working because it imaged so fast. I mean, we were, within like a day, we're like, well, this is the route we're going. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a certified Novell administrator, uh, you know, a certified engineer with Novell and everything. And, uh, you know, diehard Novell, diehard Novell for the longest time, but especially in Zenworks. I mean, I love Zenworks in like version 3 to version 7, but the recent versions, I mean, it's just, I don't know if they're trying to do too much at once, but I mean, it just fell apart. You know, and you get more and more uh, people from, you know, outside vendors that, well, we only connect to Active Directory for this service or that service. So it became, see you, Novell, sorry for the loss, but Fog was definitely a big help in that because we knew we didn't have to worry about finding an imaging product. Oh, uh, yeah, we, we, we cut the base image down. Uh, Novell, I think, was taking about 30 to 40 minutes on a typical 25 gig or so image. And... I can turn right around on a crappy 4300 and knock it out in three and a half minutes. So it's it's almost just no brainer. Yeah, it's 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 been awesome. Um, like I said, when we first started using, it, we're like, this can't be working right. <laughs> right. But yeah, once once you get it set up and, and you're running and everything, um, 
you'll never look back. Uh, exactly. We we have a site in my school district that uh, has a 100 meg network throughout the building, and uh, our image that we're deploying is about 28 gigabytes, and the for one client it was taking 16 minutes to do one. 30, 30 minutes for a second one running simultaneously, which on a hundred meg for that size of an image, I think is really great. Have you tried using multicast yet? Yes, and it, it <clears throat> in my building at least it works pretty good, uh, both on gig and one hundred meg. Um, the other building I was talking about, so they they're imaging new computers. We got. Uh, over a th over a thousand new computers that we have to image, and in that particular building, they have all the computers stacked up in one of the labs, and they're just they have stickers that they're writing the room numbers on that they go into, sticking on the uh, computers, and they're just imaging them one at a time. I guess yeah, we're trying to get multicast all working here too. Uh, I found that it works yeah. uh, at least at the master node site, but the locations aren't getting the wake on LAN packet for whatever reason, and I haven't figured out why yet. And the bad part about it is the state controls the configs on our switches, so I'm not allowed to touch those or look at those. So if it is a switch problem, I don't know. But I haven't uh, got into the wake on land um, wiki post yet I've looked at it I've skimmed it but I haven't actually done any of the commands to test it yet but I have seen that it does work at the master node site just not at the, the location sites so you're not able to like it's a, it's, it's a, that's a thing where the desktops are still sitting at the employee's desk and you're imaging from there like you're not bringing it back into a workroom where you could put your own switch in no, it's just doing it all through the production switches that the state controls. And you've ensured that Wake on Land yeah, is if, enabled? Yeah, exactly. If they're like HP or, or Cisco, you're going to run into all kinds of multicast problems if they won't allow the traffic. Yeah, they're, they're Cisco now, and I believe the state is moving to uh, Meraki in the very near future. I wish them luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what I can recommend for that is there's a plugin called Wacom Land Broadcast that's specifically designed to do exactly what you guys are talking about. Where when you have to, when you notice that your Wacom Land is working locally, but it doesn't work outside, you can actually enable this plugin and you tell it what broadcast addresses you need the Wacom Land packets to go to. Um, and when you go to set up the Wake on Land side, uh, all that Wake on Land does is it runs through a loop, and as long as Wake on Land broadcast is set up, it'll grab all of those broadcast IPs and send a Wake on Land across the entire place. I I installed that plugin. I must not understand exactly how it needs to be set up. Uh, at first, I tried the IP address of the actual fog server itself, thinking that it might handle it from the node, but uh, from reading another post, it seems like you add the 255 uh, number to the thing. So I did the first and second octet is basically how they determine the subnets of our locations. So then I did uh, it's basically like 10.106.255.255, but I don't know if that's right either. So I'm not I don't know if I even have it set correctly. I haven't. So there is another step that's involved is that you have to enable on the switches what's called UDP broadcast forwarding. Mm. If the UDP broadcast forwarding isn't enabled, it's not going to be able to forward it off to whatever domain you're trying to pass it through. We have the same thing. We're running HP Pro Curve switches, and that's where we learned all about the UDP broadcast forwarding in itself. Okay, yeah, see, Tom, uh, just. Uh, message that to I'll have to see if the state will look into that for me just to make sure that that feature is enabled I, I really don't know if they have it enabled or not and I can't get in to see now does that have to be on all switches or just the core switch of the building 
I believe it would have to be on your central switch. So however your network is laid out in order for, because everything's going to go through the main part, in order to forward it off to the other places, you have to send it there. Now if your switch or your fog server is not on the central side at all, then yeah, you would have to make the tunnel until at least all the way up to the point of your central switch. Okay. That's interesting. That's actually something I think I'm going to have to look at on Monday as well then. I didn't know anything about a, uh, a plug-in for it, so that's probably a good place to start. We've had kind of similar experience. I always just figured it was our very old 3Com switches. Yeah, I, that's a feature I don't use because I don't uh, do the imaging. Because uh, I, I have all this, uh, I don't want to hold our encryption on all the systems, so I can't really image a, a encrypted Windows thing and like add snap it, just stuff like that. So, let's see, I know uh, Austin said that he used snap-ins. What, what other snap-ins do all you guys use? How do you use them? Up to this point, uh, we've only done tests with snap-ins. We haven't actually really rolled much stuff out. Um, that's one thing that I will miss about leaving Novell and Zenworks is their application distribution. Um, and obviously, you know, you can do use AD and GPOs, but I think we're going to start looking at least for some things, um, rolling out snappings with fog if it's, uh, you know, something like that. Um, I guess the question I have with it is what kind of, does fog just call whatever file is in there? Like, let's say I have a batch file that does stuff, and inside that batch file, one of those things is install a program. Does, does fog store it on that, just wherever you're pointing it to? Or do I have to have certain things on the FOG server, like with rights to a certain folder? Or is it pretty much just the snap and just calling whatever I tell it to? So anything like file rights would be done at the file level. Joe? If that makes sense. Uh, so with snap ins, uh, you can basically run any script. Okay. So, or file. So you specify your you know command line arguments, like if you run a bash script, you run cmd.exe. Mm -hmm. and then the file is downloaded to that computer and run locally as the system account. Oh, okay. okay. That actually would help a few things, to be honest. <laughs> okay. And there are templates also that you can choose from in Fog Trunk that will help you get the syntax right as well. Uh, you can run PowerShell scripts, batch files, MSIs, EXEs. You can run shell scripts on Linux, shell scripts on OS X. Uh, theoretically, you can run any executable as long as you know the program to call that runs that executable or, or if it's already in the Windows path and available, that would work too as well. And uh, okay. with, with snap-ins, the number one thing that catches people is they have to be silent. They, they cannot require interaction because if they do, they'll just hang there and they'll never finish. They'll time out okay. now. And that's my notes. Yeah. And uh, as I don't remember who it was, but someone else said, and it's true, if there's a particular order that you want uh, snap ins to run in, just put a number in front of the snap ins and uh, start at one and, and go through, I guess, nine. Yeah. And Andrew says uh, <clears throat> they deploy pretty much everything with snap-ins, including Office, Adobe, Antivirus, uh, and that all of theirs is 7-zip compressed EXEs using 7-zip SFX Maker, which uh, is just a .cmd script which launches the installer silently. Oh, okay. Yeah. I've done that before, too. Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah, I haven't heard of that part of it. I love 7-Zip, but I hadn't, uh, didn't know about that one. 
So then essentially with that snap-in, if you were scripting Office, you wouldn't even need to make the snap-in have Office, just have the right commands to grab it from the network. Yep. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah, it makes for smaller uh, data storage on the Fox server. Gotcha. If, uh, if anybody out there has a way to brute force Chrome as default, I'd love to hear it. Um, even with uh, the Chrome GPOs, we've had issues with it not really going into effect. So, in the back of your mind, if anybody else has a purifier way. So, with uh, default browsers, that's just a registry key. Mm -hmm. um, so, you can deploy a batch or PowerShell script to update the specific registry key. Okay. We've had we've had mixed success with uh, with that, and I don't I I'm starting to wonder if it's just the fact of a GPO being confused by a current registry setting because I know there is a hierarchy of you know how they get applied. And I'm wondering yeah. if we're just having a conflict on it. I, I might like. Did you guys say that the snap ins run as system user? So so if you want to per user, uh, if you just do that registry setting as your GPO instead of the Google Chrome GPOs specifically. That might work for you. Okay. Notes. Do you think it could be your users just uh, opening up Internet Explorer or Edge or Firefox and clicking the box to say make this You can lock down the whole uh, Internet Explorer, but I think that breaks Windows, right? If you do that application lock stuff and not let IE run. And I guess there's a, there's a, there are a third option that Arrowhead IT, who I, I don't think is here today, came up with a uh, script that copies a customized user profile to a network location, and then he has another script that deploys that profile to computers as a snap-in, and it sets Ooh. it as the default profile on the computer, so any user that has never logged into that computer before or doesn't have a profile on a particular computer, it uh, Windows will basically copy that default profile to their profile and use that as the template. So if you have your default set in there already, then that's another way as well. As well as probably setting a lot of other defaults and speeding up the first time login process. I think that is... Um because this is our kind of our first year of sys prep because of AD. We never had to worry about it in the world of Novell. So um, I'm wondering if our if the sys prep image has little goofy things like that not set or not set correctly. Um, being able to kind of fix the default profile uh, for things that we find would be very beneficial. So is that was Arrowhead IT? Yeah, if you search the forms for uh, default profile, it should be the first listing. Actually, Excellent. I'll get you a link. Hey, thanks. That'll be really interesting. See what I can do there. All right, I just want to ask a question to everybody here. Um, as far as, like, imaging goes, I understand that not everybody is going to be working off the same models, and I know that some people, like, uh, I think it was uh, Chris, maybe, who said you're doing uh, encrypted drives, so you're kind of left out of the mist of all the image just because the drive is encrypted at Buddha. Right, so I can do the, um, the, the initial, uh, you know, Windows installation and whatnot, but then, like, if we update the installation, I'm not going to be using Fog to to distribute that, I have to do that through scripting and whatnot. Okay, so with that, you can technically use, from what I've been told, the raw image type, though I've been hearing mixed reports of how well that's actually working. But as far as, like, imaging in the whole, are anybody running into some major serious issues lately? I'd say at this point, um, I mean, it, it works pretty well. I mean, there's a few machines that um, we haven't gotten to, to actually pull down uh, via Pixie, but I mean, it's like one of them is my desktop, which never gets actually reloaded. Oh boy.
because like I said, it's, it, it's a few machines. We're like, we've lucked out because we've been we've been lucky enough to get um, kind of on the textbook schedule for computer replacements. So every seven years, we're allowed to buy a Mac PC. Um, at least in the past, now with um, uh, Chromebooks and everything, that's becoming more uh, more used. But we've been lucky to have like four or five now. Five or six main machine types um, that I've all handled without, and then we you know I've all here and there. But so far, those are the only ones that have to give us the job that I've not had. And mine is just like a clone uh, machine, so I'm here to keep it together anyway. I got a, I got a, um, a thing with, uh, I've never really been able to successfully clone, like I said, I've never really tried too hard. But we take a lot of um, people's machines that they replaced and we'll. Uh, put either Max Ubuntu or regular Ubuntu on there, uh, just and donate it to a local uh, nonprofit that they then give to immigrants and refugees to still communicate with their families, etc. Um, <coughs> I do that because of the onboard of licensing, etc. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah, is, that, is, is an install a better idea to do like strip that or, or imaging? What would you guys suggest with a uh, little next machine? Use the uh, EXT file system for uh, the uh, the main partition on the image. That way, it can be resizable. And uh, I'd probably go with Ubuntu as well. And I would uh, I would try it like that. I've not had any major issues with imaging Linux at all. Okay, so uh, X three or four. Four, Does probably. Yeah. Four. Okay. Ultimately, it shouldn't matter. It should work the same with two, three, or four. Uh, the only problem with moving over different type of file systems is the ability to actually expand and shrink them. Um, scripting that kind of stuff isn't exactly easy, and there aren't a lot of tools for uh, like LVM partition styles, which actually can cross different uh, disks. Uh, that you can resize it just fine, like expanding it higher, but actually dropping it so that it can be put on smaller disks isn't a very easy thing, nor am I aware of anybody that's actually been able to successfully do such a thing. All right, uh, thanks for that. Also, thanks uh, for everybody's help lately in the forums last week, because I was pretty heavy, uh, and there was my first truck installation this week. You're welcome. We should, we do our best. It's much more active today than it was when I first installed zero point three two. <laughs> so I appreciate it. Is that four years ago or something like that? Uh, yeah. Actually, I might even started with point two nine. It was a while ago. We were nervous. We were nervous there for a while before uh, the more updated version came out. We were afraid it was going to be a a dead project or something. And we're like, oh shoot, new version. It actually was a dead project. Uh, when I started uh, working at the school district I'm at, we started running into the problems where UFI was just starting to come in. This was back in 2013. So I just started picking up, trying to figure out uh, why it kind of went stale, if you will. And I was able to look at the code and start tweaking things. That's basically how I became the developer, was I was just doing a lot of extra work and then ask later on. So yeah, I'm, I'm totally glad that uh, it's not dead any further and I'm hoping to keep it going that much longer, you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. What about the donation links? Um, like are those up to date and accurate? They should be up to, up to date and working properly and they all go to now the Fog Project LLC which was created by uh, Chuck and Gian. Um, Actually, I think they did it, I want to say February this year. They finally got the LLC rights so that they could properly move um, organization rights for donations to move into a proper bank account. All right, sounds great. Thanks for that update. Hey, guys. I'm going to step in real quick. I've been kind of quiet. Can anybody hear me? Yeah. I can hear you. Yeah. Hey, so I've been using FAW for quite a while now. Um, I think the first version I used was 0.32. And... Um, I came over to this new company that I'm at, and they were using uh, Windows Deployment Server, and the guy had been working on it for like 
maybe a year and a half, two years, and never could get it working right. And uh, it was pretty impressive to take the fog and put it in, and uh, once you get your images straightened out, you know, dump out you know, a ton of machines within just a you know, few hours. They were really impressed by it. But I really haven't dove into the snap-ins, the printers, or any of that. I mean, I threw an image together, threw the machines out, and they've been using it, you know, ever since. Um, and you guys have seen me on the forums. I've asked some really ridiculous questions that I didn't know the answer to that were pretty simple. Um, but, you know, Tom's helped me out quite a bit, and I really appreciate all that. And I like what I see with the project and where it's going. Um, and the company that I work for is really impressed by it as well. So, um, I'm sticking in on this uh, snap-in today just to kind of hear what everybody's doing and uh, how their experience with it is. And, you know, I'd like to get more into the snap-ins. I'd like to get more into the printers, especially because the Windows print service that we run for Portal, um, you know, um, where I came from, we were running Linux print servers and Linux DHCP servers, and we really didn't have any issues with anything. And I, I kind of want to push most of this stuff onto the Fog server, but um, I just need to get a little bit more familiar with it. And, you know, thank you for your patience on the forums and whatnot. You're welcome. I, I think some of your biggest progress could actually be made um, by switching nowadays to the newer client. And because of the way that we've addressed how the client actually receives information, one of the problems the legacy and earlier versions of the new client I uh, had was it kept continuously spamming the server. Um, like, say you have a thousand hosts, and every five minutes on the legacy client, give or take, and every minute uh, as default for the newer client um, before we made the switch to a single call, you'd be just getting hammered um, for the clients to check in, find out what they need, start doing whatever tasking it was. And it would actually put a serious draw onto the FOG server. And nowadays, the new client will actually handle that much better because it's a single call that pulls out. And with the only exception, I think, being the snap-ins now that have to make a separate call because they have to download a file, things can actually move um, in a much smoother pattern. Um, and Joe has made a lot of progress in speeding up just how quickly those actions can actually occur. Um, printer management is phenomenal nowadays, and thanks to Arrowhead IT's suggestion with like the config file, you can actually set up the printers to install for like quotas or whatever things, whatever other things the config file is going to need. Because um, I don't really play with them too much. I'm sorry, but printer management's been significantly improved. Snap-ins have been. Uh, significantly improved as well in the sense that you can now we have templates that help you as everyone was saying earlier um, to ensure that if it's a PowerShell MSI a batch file a command prompt um, all of the designated areas are properly aligned for the file that you're trying to install um, I'm not aware of anything significant that we can do to make it any better in the sense that when snap-ins are deployed, it's based on snap-in installation. So an exit code that goes back is going to be usually that of whatever the snap-in is. So if it's a batch and you're getting an exit code 50, it's probably relating to some problem with the snap-in that was installed through the batch. Um, I, I don't know if that helps answer any of the question, but it's if you're going to use the snap uh, the client more and more, I would recommend using the new client, and not only because of all the improvements, but also it's vastly more secure. I think we're I think I've recently updated to um, one one two three or one three two, uh, or is it one two zero? One two zero is the current stable. Yes, that's that's the one I'm on now. One two zero. Um, finally got that worked out. I, I messed up and uh, installed an older version and screwed up my, my install and then went back and fixed all that and that was some of my questions on the forum. So when you're referencing a client with the version 120, do I get the new client with that or is there something I need to go download? 
you need to that you would have to install the trunk to work mainly because 120 uh, I didn't have Joe around at that point so when it was released it was probably a month or two after that that I think I started seeing him pop up on the forums and um, actually no it was slightly before then because he added the capability to use product key activation in the legacy client but in this case when it came to the new client defaulting um, it was just we had to do it side by side because both of us have to work together in the same sense to make sure all things will work properly and that didn't really get started until after 1.2.0's release and I know it's been a while since another release um, but I think it's been worth it because we're actually planning for the next version of FOG to be a total rerun. So we're trying to just make sure 1.3 is as stable and usable as possible. Okay, so I'll get the I, I'll have to wait until 1.3 to get the new client or I can go download the new client now. You could download it, but it's not going to work on 1.2.0. None of the code okay, got it. references is there. Got it. You can, however, upgrade to the developmental version of Fog Trunk. Uh, I posted the link there for you uh, to check that out. Okay. Let's see where I can find that link at. Ah, there it goes. All right, thank you all for all the work you're doing in this. You know, I really enjoy using the product. That's pretty much all I have today. Okay, thanks for joining us. Definitely, thanks. So, does anybody else? Is anyone else doing anything really interesting with fog here lately? So far for us, it's just get through our Active Directory changeover in the summer and then start getting into more fun toys and things. So pretty much status quo for us right now. Is anybody here fogging Max? I guess not. <laughs> that was a big topic last, uh, last Hangout. Is anybody doing universal images? Like one image for many models. I am. Of course yeah. you are. <laughs> Me too. We're down to basically a, uh, we have a master sysprep image and then we pull that down on the different model types and make a sysprep image off of that guy. So, not completely universal, but universal to model types. Yeah, I like the universal. Uh, it works most cases. You know, you do the if you just need to add drivers for something, you you run a WinPE environment, uh, download the image, and then run the uh, install drivers command, uh, and then you can pretty much put that image back up on the master image server, and then deploy that to the new systems. So I, I find that really useful. Uh, the, the other thing, uh, I forgot what else I was going to say. <laughs> So you do so you image the computer and then it boots up into a Windows PE environment to install drivers. No, oh yeah, okay. That thank you for that. Uh, no, I, I actually created I, a Win PE ISO, so I'll load that from the advanced menu. Okay. Uh, so on a new system, I will download the image, then boot into the Win PE ISO, run the add driver wizard inside the command line there, and then re-upload the image, and then I get it, and then I can. You know, I have that new uh, the drivers for that new system in there. Oh, so this is your process for creating a universal image. That's the universal image, and then I, I update it as I add new hardware to it. Yeah. Okay. Um. Also, I, I have I have you know ISOs for Spinrite and DBAN and Clonezilla for those. It's like, I just want to back up a computer uh, before I work on how to use Clonezilla for that purpose. So load, loading that from the Pixie menu on the on the Fog server is really really helpful. Well, we we finally got all of ours. Uh, all of ours are now automated. So as soon as I turn the machine on, 
it pixies, it grabs the image, it images, it pushes the drivers, it runs my snap ins, and then it just it sits at the login screen just waiting for the user. Uh, on a good on a good day, that's roughly twenty minutes start to finish. But um, and the drivers work by model number, so I don't have to do any special stuff on the image. Uh, Fog is handling via scripts, uh, finding out the model of the machine, and then pulling the correct drivers from the Fog server to the machine. That way, it's only getting the drivers it needs or wants. <clears throat> Are you doing that with uh, post-download scripts or something else? Yep, post-download scripts. I got it all figured out finally. The link I just posted is a guy named Andrew Single, I think is his name. He created an auto driver install script that works very similarly as well. I'm assuming this is more or less what you were using. Uh, let me check it out. Uh, kind of not really. Um, I was working with George on this, uh, and he was very patient with me throughout the process and was able to give me enough guidance to get where I needed to go. And after uh, figuring out that I had an extra line of code in the script that was causing everything to break, once that got removed, everything went seamlessly. And... So now, if I'm imaging a, an Optiplex 790, after it uh, the image comes down, it runs the post script, it calls the actual driver install script, it finds that it's a 790, whether it's 32 or 64, and goes out to the, the storage, grabs that particular driver set, copies it to the machine, and then I just set in the registry to also check C colon drivers, and then it just goes, go ahead, and it just installs them all, and I have no dings in Device Manager whatsoever. So I guess you're using uh, the uh, new, the newly revealed uh, variables that George worked on in order to get information about the system during post, uh, the posts. I forget what it's called now. No, no, not those. Uh, he was working on me with this probably about a week prior to that whole release coming out. Okay. So I had all of my stuff actually stood up and working perfectly before he uh, introduced the variable calling. Yep, hostinfo.php, that's it. All kinds of information from the fog DB available in the in, uh, imaging environment right there for you. Mind you, this also enables the possibility of USB stick booting. You just call that URL when you need to do something. As long as the host has a valid task, you no longer need uh, enforced Pixie booting. Um, and things are already there for you. I've basically generated that script so that it will tell you everything in the same sense that booting to the uh, iPixie menu will as well. Okay, so we can boot off of USB drives now? Correct. It's not a perfect system quite yet, but as long as there's a tasking, if you use uh, George's, I guess, instructions for um, how to make sure the USB stick will work, it should work perfectly fine. All it does is make the extra call, and I've already defaulted to the INIX to enable making that call. All right, cool. That'd be great, because I was just playing around yesterday with an XPS 13, and of course, we all know they don't have NICs embedded into them. So I was trying to use a USB NIC, and of course, it won't engage until Windows loads. And for whatever reason, it won't actually start working until the Windows splash screen appears and it's able to, I guess, grab the, the drivers from Windows. But if a USB stick will work, then that might be a way. Now, it's not like we have a lot of them. It was just something I was playing with. And then I thought, oh, I wonder if I could use a USB 
to uh, boot off this instead, but then I had no idea where to even start to make that happen. So I'll have to look into that part. Theoretically, using the USB stick model should work because what you're describing is basically um, the kernel has to initiate the starting of the NIC itself. And at USB boot time, um, or at, sorry, boot time, the post uh, is not able to recognize whatever that is, so it just can't enable it. Usually that's the BIOS setting uh, that you can use to enable it, but if it's not a supported thing for that model, I think the USB stick is probably the only way you'll be able to successfully do it. Yeah, and I, I was I was thinking more along the lines too of the uh, uh, the Dell tablets that we have. Uh, we we did order some eight and eight one tablets a while back, and we don't really have a way to image them neatly. We were trying to use some hacked up version of MDT to get it to work, and it somewhat did. But if we can image off. Uh, USB, then we could definitely uh, image those a lot, lot easier and a lot neater and cleaner. Understood. Let me try to find the link to uh, George's walkthrough. Let's see here. Also, uh, Scott, did um, what did you say that HP laptop was that you were working with? Um, I want to say it's. I know it's a Pro Book, and I want to say it's a 40, 40, 4350, 40, somewhere around there. Let's see if I can remember what it is. Yeah, I was just trying to look on the uh, the wiki under the working devices, but I'm not even seeing that model listed. Maybe it's a 4530. Maybe that's more like it. Okay. Yeah, 4530. There's VPN in, but I don't have it set up on this machine. According to the, the wiki, it should just work by default. And it can be kind of goofy. They were um, the the few of them that we have were actually uh, we had to purchase them and give them to one of our uh, um, I don't know what you want to call it parochial schools, and they kind of handle it. And then when they think they're broken, they give them back to us. Um, so we haven't really messed with them much. We just have them in the pile. It's one of those to do tasks. So maybe if I get some extra time this week, I'm gonna I'll go around and see what I can't figure out with them. Yeah, the, the 4530s show is fine, but like uh, 4520s look like they have some notes in there about those using uh, the different iPixie. Uh, instead of using the UNDI only dot KPixie, they were using the dot KK Pixie. Okay. And then there's also a link that you can click to. It looks like a thread called I iPixie boot issue with Realtek. So maybe there's something there. Mm -hmm. my notes. And that's how I found out about my uh, 3350 not, not grabbing DHCP was uh, I just did a simple search on form forms for 3350 and a couple of things came up and I just started reading through them and someone had the, a very similar problem I did and I found out the, the host kernel argument I set it in there as the host and then fired it back up and then it immediately just connected to DHCP and I was able to image it then. Nice. I'm going to give that a shot here. Give our, our, our master assist prep would pull down on it. Is that kernel argument in the, uh, in the wiki in the working hardware list? For the 3350? Yeah. Uh, it is, yes. Okay.
are there is there any other difficult models that anyone has? Uh, no, just so far I've only come across those two, the thirty three fifties and the E forty three hundreds. Uh, don't like sand boot, but if you just change the BIOS to AHCI, it'll work. Or if you change the exit type to grub, that also works. I know uh, one model I saw a potential issue with Pixie booting was was the HP ProBook 645G2. Um, but the fix for me was to at least to start using the iPixie.pixie file. For whatever reason, I think it was a real tech card that's in it. The real tech.pixie file didn't work. Um, it would just freeze. And then for uh, the only onlys, it would only it would actually just throw a chain node error. It couldn't actually get to the boot menu. And simply by changing um, the boot file uh, has helped correct that issue. Weirder part was that. It would only it would work on Undy only or Realtek or whatever other file uh, the first time I turned it on or after a firmware reset, which was for those models they don't have removable battery. You just hold the power button for around 20 seconds or so, and it clears the EEPROM. Uh, and then when you turn back the system on, the Undy only would work fine. But to make sure things were consistent, um, so people aren't constantly having to hold their power buttons. I tried the iPixie.pixie and that worked perfectly. I think <clears throat> iPixie.pxe is uh, probably the single best alternative, like first choice to uh, undionly.kkpxe. That should probably be what we recommend as a second choice for people. Yeah, I never really understood what they the differences were and so I'm a little gun shy on getting or moving away from the one I have that's working most of it. Uh, yeah, is there a yes, uh, there is. post or anything that describes the differences between yep. all the different iPixie settings? I'm finding it right now. Okay. Just more so that I just know as like a good to know or keep in the back of my head kind of thing. File name information. Yep, found it. Okay. Here is the link. Me and Tom posted two different links. What does yours say? Oh, they're both good. Maybe those need merged. I would agree. I don't think I've ever seen this article Tom posted before. I think Wolfbane or Dan made it. There's a lot of articles. They're hard to keep track of. So, uh, everybody have a good chat. Scott's back. I've, I've enjoyed it. And Wrong I've button. enjoyed it. So, well, I guess... I guess we can, uh call an end to this hangout it was about an hour long in total which is shorter than the first one the first one was an hour and a half um, all right then that works for me cool I'm overall I think that uh, everybody's got a really positive view of fog especially with its speed and capabilities to uh, do post installs, post install scripts, snap ins, printers. Printers was a very positive topic. Um, the new client as well and its capabilities, positive topic. Traffic reduction with the new client, very positive uh, thing. Um, as, as well as all of the different uh, universal images that you guys are making. I, I need to do that myself. Um, 
a lot, a lot of good information, a lot of links in this hangout. And we had yeah, uh, we had. I, I only have two images, one for 32 and one for 64 currently for Windows 7. We haven't ventured out on Windows 10 yet, so the space on the server is like 55 gigs used. Uh, and then, I mean, I got like uh, about 10 gigs in drivers, but uh, managing two images is so much easier than managing an image for each architecture plus each model of machine that you have. Something yeah, we, we do. have done a lot too this summer. Yep. Well, it was great. Let's see. Yeah, we do need a newer how-to for universal images. Well, I'm thinking of, uh, because I have my own mechanisms and scripts that I do for uh, prepping the system such as clean up the temporary files, remove all the uh, bullcrap Windows update files before I go ahead and update, or, or sorry, upload the file. Um, so what I'm thinking of trying to do is because of those scripts, and I saw um, Arrowhead script that looks very similar to what I'm doing yep. uh, with all the cleanup, removing the uh, hibernation crap, I just want to work together with people uh, to build a how-to, because I know that, like, George, he posts a whole bunch of how-tos, and he takes up a whole bunch of room, but he's also doing it all on his own, and I think having a collaborative effort towards making it better and whole would actually help the whole project uh, and improve things a lot. Yeah, we've actually been trying to find uh, new ways to shrink the overall OS size. Uh, I mean, we already... We dump out Windows updates and stuff like that, but we're also we're trying to figure out if there's anything else we can do to reduce just a little bit of size, even if it's by a fraction, and maybe even try getting uh, default profiles shrunken if if possible too. Well, one of the common things I found is Windows loads this folder called Prefetch, and what Prefetch is is you can think of it like a cache, so everything you click on gets a link into that folder. So one of the things my script does uh, is it removes that folder, um, and then the next time Windows boots, that folder is recreated, and again, the process all starts over. So that's a very common one people miss, um, just because Windows loves to try to make them think that they're going faster. Another thing I've always noticed is like the indexing. Um, the C drive indexing is supposed to be a mechanism that allows you faster searching. Um, the problem is that it takes an index of every file every so many minutes or hours or however long. It actually ends up taking up more room than necessary. And in most cases, it's scanning that uh, indexing location, which has a crap load more files than it would take to just search the C drive. So that would be a, just a performance tweak is to disable the indexing for that drive. Um, and then the other part is that prefetch, which is a very commonly missed one. All right, thanks. Yeah, a lot of changes with Windows 10 compared to Windows 7. <clears throat> yeah, we're we're doing that this summer as well too. Yep, I'm right in the middle of it right now. Me too. But to be honest, I'm actually loving Windows 10. There's a few things about it, but yeah, I, I've been pretty happy with it. I was glad to skip 8 as a whole. We went from all 7 to now we'll be all 10. Um, yeah, I'm glad we're doing it, but you know, it's another thing on the plate for a shorter summer. Of course. <laughs> but... Well, I think I've put off painting the deck long enough, so I'm going to go ahead and head out. But I do want to say thank you to you guys, um, developers, and all the help on the on the fog forms. Um, I know sometimes some of the stuff I post are like seriously, um, but it's been very helpful, and I certainly do appreciate all the work. No problem. That's what I'm here to do, man. I'm more than happy to answer all the easy questions. Good, because I'm sure I'll probably have some more. So. Uh, you guys have a good day, and uh, I look forward to, to doing this again. It's been real helpful. Mm, great. That's awesome. See you later. Take it easy, guys. Bye.
Well, anybody else have anything to talk about? I think I'm good for now. Awesome. Cool. Another successful fog hangout. Thank you all for joining. All right. Have a good one. You too. See you later, Andrew.